Okay, we're going to read chapter 15, page 107, Along the Mary's River. One day all the voices sounded unusually happy because we had arrived at the Mary's River. We are on the main California trail at last, Mr. Reed said. I wonder how long ago the folks we left at Fort Bridger passed this way, remarked Mrs. Donner. Brother Jake and I think it might be well for us to move on ahead. Our oxen seem to be the strongest, and the grass is so scanty, it might be better for the animals to be spread out. We'd be glad to take your teamsters with us, Mr. Reed. Yes, you might as well, Patty's father replied. I have no use for four men to drive one wagon. If they want to stay with you, that's fine with us. Milk can stay. The country we were crossing was rough. I could tell. Everyone seemed to be walking rather than riding, except for the littlest children. Evidently, the wagons were heavy enough with the provisions that had been crowded in from the ones that had been abandoned. Sometimes the teams had to be doubled to draw them up the steepest hills. I could usually tell when this was going on by the snorting of the struggling oxen and the cross shouting of the men. As time went on, they got more irritable with one another, and some of them were angry with the poor, weary beasts they were driving. One day, October 5th, as we all had cause to remember, there was a dreadful fuss as the drivers were trying to get the wagons over a particularly difficult hill. The team pulling our wagon got tangled with the oxen drawing one of Mrs. Graves' wagons. Mr. Graves' teamster ang angrily struck the animals with his whip. M Milt called to him to stop it, and Patty's father rushed up to straighten out the quarrel. Exactly what happened, I never rightly knew although I heard it talked of a great deal in years and after years. Mr. Graves' driver must have turned his whip on Patty's father, and her mother, seeing this, ran up to interfere. The whip fell on poor Mrs. Reed, and, at that, her husband drew his hunting knife and instantly plunged it into the teamster's shoulder. Oh, Papa, your head is bleeding, I heard Puss cry out. By this time, Patty was sobbing hysterically, and there was a great confusion of voices, some angry and some sympathetic, as the folks seemed to separate into two groups. Never mind, daughter, Mr. Reed answered her. Here, look after your mother while I see to this young man. But the Graves family angrily reproached him and told him to stay away. In a few minutes, the man was dead. Mrs. Reed was lay lying on the grass while Patty and Puss held damp cloths to her head. When their father came back to us, Puss exclaimed, Papa, Papa, you must let us take care of your cuts. All right, Puss, he said quietly and sat down. From the remarks that followed, I gathered that Puss washed and dressed the three wounds the whip had made on her father's head. And then they all huddled quietly together, stunned by the terrible thing that had happened. Finally, Mr. Eddie and Milt came over from the group that was consulting over the body of the dead man. They are completely unreasonable, Mr. Eddy said. I certainly wish the Donners and the rest of your teamsters were here to force them to see sense. Their emotions are running away with them, and they talk wildly of hanging you. None of them feels worse about it than I do, Patty's father answered sadly. If my life will repay them for this, tell them to take it. No, no, James, Patty's mother wailed. You struck him in self-defense and to defend me. You are not to blame. That's what we've been trying to make them see, Milt said. Mr. Breen is still arguing with the Graves family and the other men. They don't know what they're doing. Mr. Breen came over at last and reported, They've agreed to banish you, Mr. Reed. You're to go on ahead unarmed. But that's certain death, man. He can't get on alone and unarmed, Mr. Eddy exclaimed. They won't listen to reason, Mr. Breen answered. I'd advise you to accept the verdict, Mr. Reed, unjust as it is, or they're apt to do you worse. If you can overtake the Donners, you'll be all right. They can't be far ahead. But what about my wife and my children? Who will look after them? Patty's father asked. James, you must go. Milt will stand by us, Patty's mother urged. If you can get over to Setter's Fort, you can bring back fresh animals and help. It's the only way. That night, Patty and Puss and their mother wept bitterly, and the little boys cried too. Not because they understood what had happened, but because they saw the others were so miserable. Mrs. Reed kept begging Mr. Reed to leave for fear that something worse would happen to him. Next morning, mounted on his gaunt horse, he slowly rode away. As he left, I heard Milt whisper to Puss, we'll ride out after dark and take his rifle to him. 
Several days later, we came up with the Donners. They told Mrs. Reed that her husband was camped overnight with them and that Walter Heron had gone with him in the morning. The news made us all happy. At least he wasn't alone. The Indians would be less likely to attack two men than one. And when they got to Sutter's Fort, surely help would be sent to us. Our party was not free from persecution by the savages, however. On dark nights, they crept close enough to camp to shoot arrows into the oxen. None of them was killed, but the poor beasts were already worn out from the overwork and lack of good pasturage, and now wounds from the Indian arrows made them more miserable. Mr. Eddy's oxen had to be shot, and, without his team, our wagon was no more of no more use to us. There were left to us only two gaunt horses, one of them Puss's fateful little, little Billy. Tommy and Jimmy rode on these, while Patty and Puss, Eliza and Mrs. Reed walked. Their few clothes and blankets were carried in Mr. Breen's wagon. Eagerly, they watched each day for the fresh ashes of their father's campfires, and when they saw goose feathers scattered about, they knew he had meant them to see that he wasn't starving. Traveling had been slow and painful. No one said very much as he straggled along. To make matters worse, another desert-like place had to be crossed, which I heard them call the Sink of the Mary's River. It was only 20 miles, nothing like that awful salt desert, though the sand and alkali dust were deep and the horses floundered in it. The little boys cried for water and Mrs. Donner gave them lumps of sugar to pacify them.